I never had an animal thing like this except when I was a kid, I'm sure. And he used to sit in my living room, brand new, on the back of my chair. And I was alone, getting older. We had a terrible storm. And I got nervous. And where I was alone, I went and got this little thing. And took it into the bed and went to sleep, finally. And now, ever since, and this is what made me think of you, because this is on getting older, isn't it, to a degree? Yeah. I yeah. thought how much, like, how we revert, yeah. like children. And if you go around the rooms and look, you see that even in the men's rooms, uh -huh. there's a little bear, a little elephant, something sitting on the bed. And it's kind of a, something to love that's there, that's always there, because you can't call your daughter or your son at 2 in the morning and say, I'm lonely or frightened. Or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And now you begin to understand what children go through. They lug this little pal around. But anyhow, his name is Sinjin. St. John, really. Yeah, the way, the way the Brits say it, Sinjin. I like that. Gives him some dignity. <laughs> yeah, he's a good guy. Life's possibilities are limitless. We are born unique. Nature gives each of us gifts and talents. Things that we can do that no one else can do quite the same way. But how are these subject to the circumstances of our social and our physical surroundings? Has the future been set from the beginning? The depths and dimensions of our minds are unimaginable. As we age, we are all influenced by our families, our friends, our communities and our educational opportunities. Over time, disappointments and victories all impact the person we will become and the imprint we will leave behind. We are aware of who we are, how life works and ultimately how it ends and we learn about the changes that occur in us as the years pass by. Each of us becomes a part of a living record of those who came before and a guide to those who are to come. The only limit we all share is time. perspective on aging for what that's worth is the way in which one views aging has at least in my case less to do I think with me which is pretty arrogant and presumptuous but I think it is less to do with me than it has to do with the society around me um, I don't feel like I've gotten older and yet clearly I fit less well than once I did. Uh, and that has, I think, to do with the society rather than with, with age or years or something of that sort. I don't feel like I've changed a lot. The world has changed a lot. Um, and it's a world that, that I'm less comfortable in than I once was. Two years ago, my father and I started interviewing people of all ages. The youngest was a 12-year-old girl named Nicole, and the oldest was a 101-year-old man named Robert. We were looking for various perspectives and experiences on growing older. Our interviews were intimate, open-ended, and conversational. And the more time we spent on our project, the more we came to realize how unique it was. Media seemed so saturated with information on how to live longer and look better. 
most of which seemed introverted in vain. It was hard to find anything focusing on real-life circumstances that come with mortality, or some way to stimulate emotional preparation for the inevitable. No one we spoke with had an identical story or view of anything, but a few common tones rang out louder than the rest. In the beginning, we have no awareness of the future. The concept that we will one day become like our elders sets in earlier for some than others. Where fate placed us on the planet and when in time, those that teach us and our inherited biology all forge a blend of our future selves. For some, all their energy is focused on the planning and development of their young. But the degrees of fortune are vastly different. Oh, my children totally changed my life, totally. Yeah, everything changed when I had them. Um, well, I mean, I wasn't, I devoted everything to my kids, everything. I was there all the time. I don't know what I'd do without my family. I wouldn't be here, absolutely. They're incredible. Family's number one to me, absolutely. I love my family and I think it's important to stay close to them and to keep, keep the people that you love close. Maybe not just family, maybe friends as well. Maybe it's family and friends. Because your life is really sort of the people that are in it. Oh, I haven't even breached the subject of my dad, really. You don't like your dad? I hate my dad. He's a, he's a monster. I mean, all he did was beat his kids and neglected us and uh, cheated on my mom. And uh, I don't even know why he had kids. Why, why even bother if you're going to treat him that way? I had two people you were responsible for, and it was my, my mission to make sure that I could give them everything, the best of what we had, you know. So that was a huge turning point when I had them, all through my 30s, everything changed. It makes sense, I think, to have a little experience under your belt before you try to bring a, a whole new creature up in the world, this person who's going to have to face everything you've had to face. So I think so, having some wisdom and some experience uh, to help back you up makes it easier to, to kind of guide someone. I love my dad, I do. He wasn't there for me or my family. However, um, I don't think, I don't know what his deal was. I don't know, my dad's probably the most selfish person in the world. But I think he's learned like what it's like to be a selfish father. He actually inspired me to be a great father because I know what the flip side of that is. So I decided in my heart a long time ago, like back, I think it was like 94, to forgive him. And then since 94 until now, we've been steadily building on our friendship. The sweetest and the strongest person I've ever met in my entire life is my mom. In our advancing society, where industry and finance are almost worshipped, the definition of success gets lost in the repetition. And the lessons our elders are constantly trying to reinforce tend to disappear. Embedded in them a sense of there's something greater than myself, and with community we can accomplish a lot more than we can as alone. Um, connected, we're all connected to each other. Um, and the more connected we are and the more loving we are, uh, the more our society will heal and grow. Got to get the children to, to uh, live together in families again. Family life is terribly important, you know. I think my generation, I think we had it made versus yours. I think you've got a tough road to hoe. 
And I think you've got to be a very strong character in order to carry it off. You've got to be strong. You've, you've got to be good. Literally, good. The compartments of life. Health. Economy. You have to have money. Relationships. Family. I think you need to have them all. And not... If you focus too much on business, for instance, your relationship's going to suffer. Focus much on your relationship, your business is gonna suffer. It's always gotta be somewhat of a balance and I just it's just disgusting. The whole dating scene is disgusting these days. It's just disgusting. I can't stand it. Because it's just so shallow. First of all, people want an instant relationship. They want instant intimacy, instant sex, instant, you know. It's really sex, but women need intimacy first. I don't know what men need, but it seems like they need sex first, you know, but you can't do it instant. It takes a while to know me. It takes a mile for me to know you. It takes a while for that to happen. And so, and once I'm connected, once I'm hooked in, I'm so vulnerable. I'm so raw. So to discard me, for it not to work or for you to be having affairs with other women or to be online doing porn and doing all these other things just breaks my heart. I can't do it anymore. It's like, if that's what you're interested in, good, go do that. But I don't want that. I don't want that being part of my life. Every single woman fears that. It's, it's a real fear. It's a real fear. It's friends and family because just being lonely isn't fun. You always need to surround you with people you love. When you go into the structure of the brain, let alone the mind, but just the physical brain, it should inspire the same amount of awe that looking out into sort of the naked universe does. There are hundreds of millions of possibilities and that is reproduced each and every time in, in each person. Dr. David Rubin is a member of the faculty at Harvard Medical School. He's a general and pediatric psychiatrist and is currently the director of training in child and adolescent psychiatry at the Massachusetts General Hospital and McLean Hospital. He is a strong advocate of family therapy. We sat down with him over the course of two days and 10 hours of interviewing in which he shared with us his experience in development of the young, emotional prosperity in those growing older, and his profound insights on preparing children for success in their adulthood relationships. One a little bit more abstract form of development that we all go through is the ability to self-soothe. How do we, when in the face of adversity and upset, how do we make ourselves feel better? And not everyone at the same rate or time develops through those stages equally. In early life, a newborn who is essentially, you know, maybe not even totally aware that they are controlling their own movements, but certainly they are distressed at times. They feel uncomfortable, they're hungry, they're wet, and they begin to cry. They have this instinct to cry, to send out this signal to the caregiver. And mom comes, typically mom, and makes them feel better. So people um, come up with different kinds of ideas about what's going on there. Wh what is the baby learning? When I'm upset and I cry and someone comes and soothes me, did I learn anything about how to soothe myself someday? Or did I actually uh, stunt my ability because I relied on someone else to do it? And you get into these issues with all kinds of things with childhood, letting a kid cry it out. Um, you know, how else are they gonna learn to do things? The way it turns out though, probably, is that in that very early part of life, the setup for making someone who's gonna be able to soothe themselves is, is probably to soothe them. And people look at things that are uh, sometimes called synchronicity. How good is a caregiver at detecting what it is that's upsetting the baby and then meeting that need. So the baby's hungry and the baby cries. How good is, let's say, mom, at figuring that out and doing that? 
Now babies are very flexible and adaptable and it's not like you have to be perfect every time. But in general, a mom who responds fairly promptly and accurately seems to reinforce the development of a person who one day will be able to soothe themselves. There's a kind of a, a saying that, that you, you can't spoil a newborn and that's probably very true. A newborn needs to feel that the universe is reactive to them, is responsive to them, that it's not just this sort of kind of existential angst that we then have to take on maybe later on in life. Uh, so the baby who cries and someone who comes and soothes them is probably on their way to being better at soothing themselves than the one who from the very beginning has to work it out on their own. Then the world seems more of a unresponsive chaotic environment that from day one, we're thinking I'm, I'm not comfortable in this place. So in the beginning, it's very important to soothe newborns and infants. You can't expect her to say or do anything. There's, there's no predictability there based off of having known someone for so long, which you would, would think were, were trends. You know, some people, some people when they see you for the first time every time, uh, smile ear to ear, you know, almost go through the same routine, uh, you know, they'll say the same things, well, you know, welcome, blah, blah, blah. Like, uh, my godmother's like that. I always know exactly how she's going to respond every time I see her. It's just the way she is. Mom's not like that. Mom's interesting. I think it, it there's paybacks that uh, you can't... Uh... They're priceless, you know, uh, to hear my kids talking to each other and laughing with each other, that's huge. Um, to know that I've given them to each other, you know, it's an honor. It's totally an honor. You have a huge accomplishment. You know, it's just really, it's, it's, a, it's a miracle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> What's important is um, how you treat your family members and hoping that they will continue to treat others the same way and how, you, how do you want them to um, move forward and how do you want them to remember you and how do you want them to uh, interact with their family and friends in an ongoing way. As you continue to mature, what you really want is ultimately that whole process to be internal, that when I face adversity and I'm upset and I'm hurt, I, I've had the experience of being soothed so many times, done well, demonstrated for me. I have started to mimic it. I can now do it all, all in my head. Within milliseconds, I have gone through those little emotional processes in my mind that recreates that period of really that starts with being soothed by someone else. But not everyone develops along that continuum at the same rate. There is far more variability to that than things like when you first walk or when you first talk. We see this can be a problem for older adults sometimes and young adults. It's people who still need an external force to always soothe them. This is a difficult cross to bear as a person. Um, because there are many of our upsets that will happen when we are almost alone, essentially alone, we're otherwise surrounded by strangers or people that we don't necessarily, you know, can't really be intimate with, and we need an ability to, to do it all within ourselves. When people can't do that, they start to suffer in their relationships because other people who are ahead of them, let's say, in that development, don't usually understand exactly what to do anymore. When the two-year-old falls and scrapes their knee and cries, everyone pretty much has a sense, oh, oh, this is what we do, I'll pick you up, I'll... nothing. When you start to become in your 20s and your 30s, and there's still that intense outcry that someone else has to come right now and make this better for me, some people will initially really rally and say, all right, we have to help you and support you. But sadly, sometimes people ultimately start to withdraw because they're, they're at a loss as to what to do with someone who's older but still is so dependent on you coming to soothe them, doesn't seem to do any of the work themselves. It's a, it's a very 
subtle but interesting aspect of development that probably has a lot of impact in relationships ultimately is how self-contained are you in that process of self-soothing. Unless you teach them how to live together when they're, they're younger, when they, when they uh, grow up, when they get married or, or whatever, then they don't understand that, uh, that how to uh, cope with the other person and to cope with life itself. I had an opportunity to raise these kids whose real father was a deadbeat. And they were six and nine when I met them. And uh, they really had nothing when I met them. It was, it was pretty sad and I thought, I can come in, I can save these people. And so to save them, I, I, they needed to change their ways. But just like it's hard if somebody wants you to change your ways because that's what they think you should do. That's what my dad did to me, and I found myself doing that with these children. And uh, perhaps it's the lack of the, uh, the paternal bond that, uh, you know, it, it is in, uh, the struggle does have an end, it seems, when they're not your kids, <laughs> you know, biologically. Too many, too many divorces, too many children out there without a set of parents. You know what? I think I need more of somebody taking care of me emotionally than I need someone taking care of me financially at this point. You know, that's why, you know, my relationship right now is just so awesome is because he's present with me and he loves me for who I am and he enjoys my company, he wants to be around me, you know, and that is what I've been looking for all my life. Someone that wants to share life with me, you know, so to me, that's what I want to be taken care of. I don't want to have to do it alone. Also, in bringing up children, I don't know, when their children are so split sometimes, they'll say, it's my father, well, no, it's not my real father, it's but it's my other father, and and don't, some of them don't, uh, don't even have a consecutive home. They have to go away on weekends to the other parent, and so those there are things we got to get the children to, to uh, live together in families again. Family life is terribly important, you know, like that. You start thinking, how much longer do I have? And. The, the love thing is, is important. You, you want that. Companionship, love, somebody, a best friend is there all the time. I think people take life so seriously. And I think that uh, a lot of times I see, you know, this is a funny subject, but I see young people who, whose husbands stray a bit and but they still love their wives, but the wives get all upset and they want a divorce. And so what? What makes the difference? I mean, forget it. Live through it. Um, and I think it happens a lot. I think I've always had the theory that most men, 99% of the men, have an extramarital affair. And if you don't make a big deal out of it and go all screaming and yelling, you probably get over it. So that's my philosophy. As we move forward, the roles of parent and child start to transition. And very often, tension builds as the wisdom imparted to the young comes full circle. We don't know how to interact as, to, as this elder generation and the next generation coming up, the one in charge. Um, and we don't know how to let that happen on the elder side and on the, on the um, young side. We don't have the kind of respect um, at times that that I think our my mother was looking for. You know, um, I didn't go to her for advice, or I didn't make I didn't try to make every day uh, of her life easy, and it, she didn't have it easy. You wonder what the future holds. You know, definitely. You know, what will happen, or you know, will I? I, I never would want to be to my children, 
a burden, you know, and I, I think about it. First and foremost, I don't want to be a burden to my children. I want them to live their lives and, and, and be able to do whatever they want. I mean, on Father's Day, I used to ask them what they wanted to do because, it, you know, that's what made me happy. I don't want them to have to have to nursemaid me, you know, and I'm not sure financially whether, you know, we're all going to be able to afford the kind of care um, that Carol and I might need. Um, so that's, that's a worry, I think, more than the, the thing itself. My dog that lives in Surrey, I'm sure, would want me to come live with her, but I wouldn't do that to her. Why? Well, they keep, listen, if you've got an old mother living with you, you give up a certain amount of freedom. And I know from experiences with uh, my grandmother, that had a stroke when I was young. I mean, she was a tremendous burden on the family, and you know that was before you could, or my parents or anybody could afford to, to put people somewhere to have them taken care of. The family was, you know, and I know my my mother and father as as towards the end, although they weren't a burden for a very long period of time. I mean, it's still a burden. You don't want to be a burden, but there's a. Um, being dependent on other people isn't necessarily a burden. Uh, I think I used to be upset with my parents for not including us in um, things that were going on because they didn't want to be a burden. And, and they were my age now. But um, I guess that's not perception of burden and actual burden might be totally different, you know, for the children and the parents. We didn't find it a burden with my parents because we all took turns, you know, and we, we just felt that that was part of, you just did that, you know, you, you, they, they took care of you for all those years and I think the, the least you can do is, is pop in and just make sure that they're being cared for properly if they end up having to go to a nursing home, that you just don't leave them there and, and forget them. And I think that's just, that's so important. We make this very difficult dance, I think, between our elders and uh, the generation that's in charge. And I want to learn how to step back and make sure that my kids don't feel like I'm pushing and pulling, pushing and pulling against them, which my mother was. Um, that was a constant um, difficulty. I don't want her to have to take care of me. I want her to, I want her to be there and care about me. I just don't want her to have the physical um, responsibility of taking care of me. The important thing is that um, People don't forget their, just because you're getting older, young, young people, your, your kids or whoever, always um, remember that um, these people are still, they need you, you know? They need you more than ever as they age. And I think that the one thing I think about is, um, I want to make sure I'm good to my kids today so that they won't forget that. <laughs> I think as a society, we may learn. Um, we're going to have to, we're, we're becoming a society of elders. We've got a, our generation, um, this people born in the 40s, um, we're going to be a majority. Uh, and that's, that's something that this society is going to have to cope with. Mary Jane is not the only one with this belief. In fact, it is projected by the U.S. Census Bureau that the population aged 65 and older is expected to more than double between the years 2012 and 2060, from 43.1 million to 92 million. That would be equivalent to the entire populations of New Jersey, Florida, Texas, and California combined. If those estimates are correct, we really will become a society of elders. What's old age? What is old age like anyway? I always, they always talk about these old people now. Now who the heck are they? 
because I, I never figure, because I always think of an older person, you know, somebody always wrinkled up and sits in a, a chair and so forth. I don't think people do that as much now. I think attitude is, is, is more than, than just, uh, you know, wrinkles or bald, you know, male pattern baldness. Well, I always tell my students, getting old is something that happens if you're lucky. When a person talks about death instead of sex, then that person's old. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't go that route. Um, no, I don't think I'm old. I think I'm older. I mean, definitely. Uh, consider myself a mature person. I can make jokes about being old with the teenagers that I treat, you know. I'm optimistic, basically. About everything? Yeah, I would think so. Well, I run into a lot of people who are the same age as I am, who don't seem as healthy as I am, who don't seem uh, just as physically comfortable as I am or as strong. And then, then again, you meet people who are a lot stronger. But I feel pretty good. You know, it's a very natural thing to progress into uh, senior living, you know? You know, a lot of the things you worry about, <laughs> it just doesn't matter. Like every day there are things you, you worry about that, you know, you have to ask yourself, will it matter five years from now? Will it matter three hours from now? I feel that as long as I have my health, I'm on top of the world, and my age is just a number. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. I don't fear getting old. It's natural. It, you're supposed to live, <laughs> you know, and hope, like, whatever you plan for your life, for me, have children, raise a family, get old, see their family, and then die. So that's kind of, I'm, again, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing, playing with my grandchildren. I had a 102-year-old lady, 102, she was supposed to be turned 103 this August, and she died like two weeks before her birthday. She was a hot ticket. She'd walk right in, you know, she'd be like, can you get rid of these keratosis? I hate these things, you know what I mean? She, but she was so funny and so vibrant, and but she was always, you know, she was just out, she was interacting with people. I think you continue to redefine who you are as you go through life. I think, you know, it's sort of like uh, snakeskin. You sort of shed off what's less important and you morph into something that, you know, I think it's very, life is very dynamic. I mean, you go through cycles of things and I'm, I'm looking forward to the next cycle. I don't consider myself elderly. I don't consider, um, well, the older I get, the older elderly becomes, you know. 90 might be elderly. Say. My grandmother lived to be 100 and, well, she, would, she died just a few days short of 100. And she took the attitude, it's only a number. And that woman, at, in her 80s, she was playing volleyball. She, she was out there playing volleyball with us in her 80s. She had an outlook that was just unbelievable. You know, and I said, oh. I'm going to be 30. It's only a number. Best years of your life. Well, what's what's the peak age? Uh, oh, probably, probably fifty on. Fifty, uh, fifty upwards. Fifty was the best time for you. Uh, uh, approximately. Why? I don't know why. Just the medium point in my life, I guess. Six to 12, 
And at 12, the boy thing got in the way, junior high, boyfriends, girlfriends, and that kind of thing. And then you had to kind of change your thoughts and actions, and, and it wasn't as much fun. I was really glad when I hit my 30s. I just felt like finally I was an adult. I had my children, I had a life, um, I liked where I lived, um, I, you know, was doing what I liked to do. My 30s were good, I think, from what I remember. Um, I guess, yeah, now I'm feeling just more, more myself. 40 wasn't so bad. All my friends got together and they had a party for me and they all wore gray wigs, shawls, walkers, and greeted me at the door with a wheelchair for me. That was my 40th birthday. Actually, in terms of overall of my life, these are the best years right now. This is, it doesn't get any better than this because the money's gotten better and I have a granddaughter, my kids are doing great. It's all, all on that, that aspect is, is it couldn't be better. And I, I, I mean, I'm willing to trade off my physical well-being for that, I guess. How old do you feel? Um, how old? How, it depends on the day sometimes. I'll bet you'll feel the same way sometimes. You know, we all do. I became 70, and I, I didn't feel like 70. 80, no, don't feel 80. So, 60. You know, 50, 45, you're going through the so-called menopause stage, which is crap, you know? I mean, that's a bitch. I'm sorry, but it is. So you, you go over that, that 43 to 55 sort of in there, you become 60, and it's wonderful. <laughs> it's just great. Well, I can't believe I'm 81. That, that really boggles my mind. I think when I hit 70, I began to think mm, bad things can start to happen. How old do I feel? I'm kind of, in some ways, I'm kind of glad to be 90. I don't know why. I know everybody says it, but your health is everything, particularly when you're aging because, you know, healthcare, the way it's going, um, I don't want to have to take anything. Fortunately, I don't now. And, you know, I don't, I'm trying to prevent that because, you know, seeing my mother and my father, how difficult it is to be sick and, and, and how you have absolutely very little quality of life when you are sick. If I do have a backache for a short period of time, I think, wow, I understand why people are feeling grumpy, because it really, <laughs> it really changes things. My rotator cuff, it, it I, I ripped it or something, sleeping. Yeah. You know you're getting old when you injure yourself sleeping. The qual your quality of life when you get older really does go down. You have to give up a lot. You know, I could no more sail now. I can't even get on a boat without help. And, Although it doesn't bother me as much now as it did when I first realized that I couldn't do it anymore. To the point where you realize your limitations to do things and learn. You reach a plateau after a while. Reflexes, that bothers me a lot because, you know, I, I like motorcycles, I love them. Um, and it's just a function of hand eye and you know, my, my wrists don't bend anymore and other things that are pretty critical to, to that doing that. And, and so I'm limited in, in what, what I can achieve. And that's... But you're still riding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll do it until I get scooped up off the pavement. You gradually see your uh, faculties not so good. My hearing obviously is not as good. Fortunately, my eyes seem to be fine, but the, the balance problem and I just don't have as much energy as I used to have. You know, you have aches and aches and pains that you didn't have at 49. But, um, I mean, I think even in 49 you have, you know, people have aches and pains in their 30s. You know, it's like, 
you know, it depends on how your health is and everything. Uh, I've had fibromyalgia or most of my life, so, you know, I've really never known uh, my life with, without pain, you know, having a pain somewhere. See, the three things you miss are your eyesight and your hearing, which I, I have uh, hearing aids, and your balance, those things are, oh, it's something. And uh, for balance, when you're walking, you have your cane, but you don't start and look all around like that. You can't do that. If you did, you'd be end over end. And you've got to watch where you're walking. Time has its effects on every, every part of the body. Uh, it's a basic. It's a basic reality. As, as we metabolize, we make uh, different kinds of byproducts that in subtle ways affect the structure of our cells and our DNA. So time always has some kind of effect, but different people may be able to repair some of the damage that just time does more readily than others, which then puts us at all at, at uh, sort of unequal paces of aging. I've had a shoulder replaced, um, which has been an enormous help. Um, I got to the point where if I went into a parking garage where I had to get a ticket out of uh, a machine to my left, uh, I had to undo the seat belt, open the door, get out, use my right hand to get the ticket out of the, out of the uh, machine. Um, I now have pretty good range of motion in my left arm. I mean, I'm aware of my physical limitations. God knows I, I could make several things that have gotten worse. The one thing I noticed in your question, have any, has anything gotten better? I used to have horrendous migraine headaches. And at the age of about 55, they started going away. And now I never, ever have one anymore. My doctor, uh, my uh, GP, um, he, he just says, whatever you do, he keeps saying, whatever you do, I keep it up. My tennis game is as good as it was when I was 50. That's partly a matter of the fact that uh, rackets are different. Um, but um, I don't feel uh, however you're supposed to feel at 80 years. I think. Getting, making sure I get a lot of exercise, I really think makes a difference in that respect. Um, I'm not the quintessential stereotype nursing home patient. I'm a little younger yeah. than the normal crowd. How old are you? I'll be 60 in a, in a few weeks. Oh, okay. okay. And I've been in a nursing home since I've been 53. It's basically because my medical condition from my spinal cord injury uh, has just progressed to the point where I need 24-hour care. But um, life here for me is really, uh, really stimulating. And it might seem um, hard to, to, to guess that would be the case for somebody my age. But the folks that live here, uh, many of them are, are so, so with it, and they have so, such rich stories to tell. 95-year-old folks who are just sharp as a tack, mm -hmm. telling you how things used to be. Um, the stories that people have lived, you know, just amazing. It's just history all around. I enjoy that part of it. This is my place. Cool. Be it ever so humble. Got my own little table with my computer set up. I got a big TV, DVD player, printer for my computer. You know, it's good enough for me. Yeah, I got the window, and once that's opened up, it looks out into a nice, uh, nice view out there. When you have the power now, you know, when you have the power at four years old to manipulate your world, uh, to lose that would be, would be mind-numbing. I hate the idea of being a cripple. That's a, that's a penalty for living too long. What is? 
having these problems. <laughs> it really is a matter of attention and focus. What about yourself do you focus your energy on? What parts of you do you use to derive your own self-esteem? If you're going to base them on things that will deteriorate with age, that's a hard road to travel. But if you shift your attention to things that will preserve, then it allows for, for the aging process to be less tragic. I think there's such a self-fulfilling prophecy for people who fear aging and fear the, the darker seasons of the year. And I think if you go into life worrying about that, yeah, it's gonna be awful, <laughs> you know? I love being in my 50s. I'm looking forward to my 60s and my 70s because I think you, be, you define yourself as you age. Um, you get to know yourself better and you get to be more accepting of yourself and you understand what's important in life and what isn't and you just let a lot of things go and it's, it's really liberating. What experience gives that individual study sometimes can is it it gives such a sense of pattern recognition, of just kind of reading the tea leaves and, and, and knowing what's going on in a, in a gestalt way. Um, experience in any field, in any discipline, ultimately brings that with it, this kind of ability to recognize patterns easily. And old people can still do that. And, and if they can value that, that they are able to do that so readily, that's a healthier attitude than focusing on the fact that there's this particular part of the job that I can't physically do anymore. Somebody else can do it. And, and, and at the end of the day, it's getting the job done that is, that is nice to derive your esteem from as opposed to which parts of it you do. It's not so much the age that you live to, I think it's more like quality of life. So if I'm 100 and I'm still able to get around and walking and doing things that I like to do. Maybe I'm not as active as I am now, but as long as I'm sort of enjoying myself. I, I guess when it, when it comes time to become incontinent, uh, I don't know, I'd figure something out. Skydive with a broken parachute or something, I don't know. Cause, so, that's, so what's old? Uh, old is, uh, well, in uh, the same case you had is the same case, uh, I had where we had a grandmother uh, who mentally lost, you know, the ability to be who they were, the memories, the the, the character. You know, that's it's terrible. You know, so uh, I would never want to do that, or anybody I know or care about to ever have to go through that. I don't necessarily want to be in the position that I'm living to 100 and for the past 10 years I've been confined to my bed or I can't talk or I don't know who I am or who my, my kids are. I am very frustrated when I can picture something and I'm talking to someone and I want to tell them about this and that is not going to come into my mind for a long time. It'll happen later in the day, maybe, maybe not until the next day but it's trying to remember the name of something um, or, you know, if I'm in the middle of a conversation and all of a sudden, ah, oh, like right now, I want to be able to tell you what that is. I don't want to like start worrying, like do I have a problem with my memory, you know, or maybe I just have too many things on my mind, but it definitely seems like I have to make, it, I have to write things down, I don't know. I hope not, I don't like to think about that. Certainly one thing is very true. If you become concerned that you're losing your memory and you start to really focus on it and ask yourself, or you're really preoccupied, am I forgetting things? You will identify the countless things you forget all day long and that you have been forgetting all day long for the last 50 years. But because you've turned your focus to it, it now becomes um, kind of all-consuming, and you can really, you can really spook yourself. I used to have a, a old country store, and I used to go there every day, and I used to order, and I used to deal with people and talk to the customers, and then I sold that store, and I didn't do anything. 
And I really think that um, I could see that was made a difference in how I started to, to think. I think that, you know, people need to have something to stimulate their minds. If they don't read or, or, or do something, I really think that you, you start to lose it. That's a terrible thing, I think, for anyone to have to live through. I can't even imagine what goes on with that person, where they wake up and, well, it might be something small, like I forget where my slippers are now every day, turning into, well, like I saw my grandmother would forget that she'd been married to my grandfather and they'd have been married for 50 plus years. I believe in the living wills so that my husband is, um, knows exactly how I feel. My friends know how I feel. I would not want to be on a ventilator. I would not want to be fed with a tube when I couldn't be active in the moment with my children. Uh, I think it's a tragic economical situation to spend all that money on that situation. I won't make that decision for somebody else, but for myself. If I have the choice, I would make it for myself. I've pronounced deaths. I've, um, you know, seen people get better. I've been there through traumatic deaths, very traumatic deaths, and I've let people go peacefully and everything is wonderful too. And I've been there to help ease that process, but I feel like even still, I know less and less about what I would want. I think it's, um, it's really difficult to say until you're there, until it's yourself. Throughout time, it's one of the most difficult realities humans have to face. Our awareness and our intelligence make it more troubling for us than other forms of life. When we're young and our future is bright and we've lived so little, the idea of losing it all is unbearable. But when a sense of purpose is gone, the end is not only accepted, but often welcomed. I know they'll never do it, but I think there ought to be a pill that we could take when we're ready to go. God, but you can't do it. I asked my doctor, I said, come on, when it's my time to go, I think I'd like to be in charge. No way. But I, well, I do wonder about that, because I have a relative, I think, who did that to it for himself. Where he got the pill, I don't know. As a matter of fact, I, I, I always stopped part of the whole mess of uh, my obituates. Figured I could use them before I wanted to leave. <laughs> and one time I decided I wanted to leave, after I suffered a stroke, and I got out the pills, and damn if I didn't drop the ball on the floor, <laughs> when the girls came and saw them, they, they wouldn't come back to me, of course. But at that time, I would have used them. Now, you had those pills stored at home? Yeah. Why? I, I, I always figured I might need them. I always need a way out, like, uh, like a diplomat sometimes they'll carry a poison pill with them. Things get intolerable, they can use that. People talking about living to be 150, and I don't think I'd choose that now if I had the chance. Not unless I could go out and be part of the world. We spend a lot of time pushing people for treatment and that we, um, you know, we spent, we're taught as nurses to take care of the whole body in a holistic approach. And we spend a lot of time trying to um, make them feel comfortable and to give them what they need. Yet on the other hand, it, it, we feel, I feel as though um, sometimes we don't give people the whole perspective that we push for treatment constantly. There's a very fine line, and people have a difficult time finding comfort in a situation um, where they could make it more difficult or more, more easy. And I'm not talking about 
giving too much morphine to a person. I'm talking about just helping families make decisions about this is the end of life. It's inevitable. All these things are happening. And um, your parent, your loved one, is there's not a lot of choice here. Nurses are the ones there in the middle of the night when the patient finally says, I'm so tired, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to. My family wants me to, and I just am tired. I want to be done. And they're so sick, and you're there holding their hand, and you're saying, you know, you're the captain of the ship. You can do what you want, and I'm here to help you um, say what you need to say to whoever you need to say it to. And by the time the morning comes around, and the family shows up and the doctors show up, it's that brave, tough face again, and, and they just keep pushing on. I think as you, you age, you may be less happy. Um, less happy? Yeah. Why? I, I suppose I'm not as receptive to positive things and happiness. I mean, both of my parents have died, and there's, there's no coming back from that. And that's, you know, when they were alive, I didn't have that that part gone from me. I was still a part, and now that part's gone. And, and you see things disappear in your lifetime that you will never, ever retrieve. I, I didn't always know what was important. I, I think that comes with age. I think, I do yeah. think that wisdom comes with age yeah. and experiences, and particularly death. When, when, when you start to experience death in your, in your life, people, when you lose people close to you, it really does ground you and you really do start to, to realize what really matters in life. To have met so many people and to have lived with your lives parallel with so many other people, you know, to either know that you're leaving or that they've left or they're leaving would be kind of sad. Oh yeah, yeah, I've lost a lot of friends. Um, a lot of friends from high school. Living out in the country, there were curvy roads, there were car accidents, there was cancer. Um, classmates died of cancer when they were 15, 21, and you know, they're still, they're still going. And so I'm, I feel very fortunate to be as comfortable as I am. I think losing three family members, two recently, um, two brothers, um, it just, it just changes your whole out, outlook on everything. You never really get over losing your spouse, ever. I didn't think, which I should have, more in terms of my parents getting old. They were always readily available to stay with the kids. They had, the, had us to visit. Um, and it didn't occur to me that they wouldn't be around forever. And then, boom, my mother was gone at 65 overnight. And that was a big jolt to the whole family. She was everybody's favorite, among other things. Oh, I feel cheated about my mother. I lost her when she was 70. And I was, um, I was a new mother. And I really wanted my mother around, <laughs> you know. Just, uh, she was an incredibly nurturing person and the consummate mother and uh, when I became a new mother I really wanted her around and so I feel cheated by not having her around longer but she's here <laughs> I moved uh, December of last year so I've been here a little over a year I have a cross I wear that my oldest son and daughter-in-law bought me. My husband and I don't want them to have to do a lot of preparations that we should have done when we were alive. And I've worn the cross since my son gave it to me. So we had picked out our lot and then we picked out our gravestone. And I had my cross put on the gravestone. I, I think if you... You should start aging when you're born, because if you don't have a good attitude, all through your life, 
right. when you start changing that attitude comes right into the changes and it affects the changes. You know, we know we're going to get old if we're going to live. We shouldn't hide it. You know, celebrate every part of your life, your, your death as well as your birth. You know, I don't think about it much. I, I'm not afraid of getting old. I'm not afraid of death at all. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really not afraid at all. It, it's just, I think, uh, it's, it's depressing to think that there's more to be done and that you can't do it. Like that said. Uh, so, and it's not a, it's not necessarily a fear so much as just well, that would really stink. I am not afraid of death. I'm afraid of what happens, like, you know, what caused my death, but I'm not afraid of death, death. Like if, you know, I guess if someone had a gun to my head, I would be afraid, like, you know, because it's the moment. But I, I guess it kind of depends on what am I dying for. I do fear a painful death, like a traumatic car accident or uh, falling off a ladder. Um, you know, I don't want to be laying on the ground with a broken back. If I knew I was going tomorrow, I wouldn't be upset. I don't want to be in pain, though. I'd like to do what my father-in-law did. You know, he just went to sleep one night and he never woke up. That's the way everybody would like to go, but it doesn't happen. I'm not concerned about dying. I, that doesn't bother me at all. When you're, when you're done, you're done. I hope it can be quick and painless, but that's not always the way it happens. I'm happy with my life, and I mean, if I were to die tomorrow, that would be okay. I, I wouldn't want to, but it's all right. I'm, I'm okay with that. I have a certain amount of issues, so when I'm not feeling well, that's when I get thinking, it's time to go. But I think it is time to go, really. And I've got children waiting for their inheritance. Come on. <laughs> if I found out that I was terminal myself at 40, I might be bumming if it happened anytime soon because life's good. I don't want it to end. I'm thinking that heart disease is the way to go. My father died of heart disease, and my mother essentially had cancer. And, um, he was just walking down the hall, and so, I know, let's eat bacon. <laughs> <laughs> let's eat bacon. <laughs> Not everyone gets to experience old age. Those that do have varying degrees of pain and joy, both physical and emotional. And maybe the only thing we learn through our conversations with everyone is that age is not something that can be overcome. Our perception of power and control and ability will all be taken away over time. The most successful seem to understand, above all, how strong acceptance can be. Our identity is going to transform. How others view us, and especially how we view ourselves. And becoming one with our new self is the constant struggle. I know there's plenty of women who are freaking out about 40 and 50, and I never understood that. I, I, I just, because I love, I love every age that I've ever been, because it just brings different experiences, and, and I just don't look at it that way. Ultimately, attitude is the only device we have control of until the end. Our attempts to stay active socially and mentally and physically become a challenge since the outside world becomes foreign and loss becomes greater every day. We hope in older age to be able to go back and to reflect on life and say, is it okay that I existed? Was it all right that I was here? Did, did what I do make sense? Was it, was it worth it? Maybe there is no sense to it, but I, I was me, I did it my way, I did the best I can. When this becomes a crisis or a, a failure is when it ends ultimately in despair. I'm a person who believes that uh, it's who you surround yourself with. Um, and if you have 
you know, good support of friends and family that you can do almost anything. You can make it through. In many ways, the show is going to come to an end. But everyone gets to leave something behind. I guess one of the things as I, as I look toward retirement is what legacy can I leave? What can I teach? How can I leave my imprint? Who we impact and how is the only thing that will carry on after our time is up. And our immortality exists in who they are and how we make our mark. I think if I was able to raise at least one cool little dude or dudette uh, who was someone of a, of a good character and nature, yeah, you could turn out the damn light. I'm cool with that. And there are still moments of joy to be embraced. To value them and ignore the rest is a decision the wisest ones seem to make. These are good years, too. I'm not saying I'm, I'm happy, but um, I wish I had more years ahead. Life is full of experiences, isn't it? Everything you'll do is an experience, and that's what it is. And do you learn from it, or don't you learn? And when I think back of the things I, I should have done uh, and didn't, I think, well, OK. I learned from them. That was, that was my purpose and purpose in being here. I have some purpose for being on this earth. And there's so much that we have to learn, and we can't seem to learn at all. I'm living life now. As far as I'm concerned, this is it. Do I think about death now? No, I think I'm going to live forever. That may be crazy, but that's the way I, I look at life.